All right. We are in the third cycle of speeches. That begins with Eliphaz in chapter 22. And he says in 22, verses 1 to 4, that God is beholden to no one. He does no one else's bidding. And since God is just, the implication is that Job is suffering judgment for his sinfulness. And then he says in 5 to 11, he accuses Job of various sins. And he says at the end there in 10 and 11 that that's why Job is suffering. Job is guilty of these sins, and that's why he's, in fact, enduring what he's enduring. And then in 22, 12 to 14, he denies any suggestion <clears throat> that God's punishment of Job is a misjudgment that's born of God's ignorance about the matter. And as I said, right when we ended last week, Job may at times wonder whether God does in fact know his such situation, but Job strongly suspects, in fact says in different places, that God does know it. God is all-knowing. And from Job's perspective, he suspects very strongly that God, yes, he does know the situation and he just doesn't care. You see, in Job's present state, he thinks God is unjust. And so, yeah, he knows it, but he doesn't distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. So he knows it and just doesn't care. Now, in 22, 15 to 20, this is Eliphaz, he says that, that Job, in insisting that the wicked prosper throughout their lives, remember Job has been citing them to cases where he says, look, you see that the flip side of the injustice coin where he says, no, you see that the wicked prosper and they go ahead and live out their lives. Well, Eliphaz here, he says that in, ins that in insisting that the wicked prosper throughout their lives, that Job is falling in line with the common delusion of the guilty, that they will escape God's judgment. He says, see, you're you're swallowing this lie that every guilty person tells him, himself that he'll get away with it. And so that's what he tells him. In the reality, according to uh, Eliphaz, the reality is that whatever prosperity these people temporarily enjoyed from God's hand, that's washed away in the river of God's judgment that destroys their foundation. And then Eliphaz claims that at the end there, he claims to stand with the righteous who rejoice at the wicked person's ultimate comeuppance. So he's standing there with them, and when the guy who flourished for a while and then his foundation is washed away, God judges him. He's there with them, and they are rejoicing over this guy getting his comeuppance. Then he says in 22, 21 to 30, he appeals to Job to humble himself and repent. You see, this is a constant refrain of what they're saying to Job. Humble himself and repent, and what will happen then? He will then be restored to blessings and abundance. That's the path forward. If you will humble yourself, if you will repent, well, then God will bless you. And so he tells him that there. Now, Job responds, or he has his speech in, after this in chapters 23 and 24. And Job says in 23, 1 to 7, he first, he speaks of his suffering, and then he fantasizes about calling God to account for his unjust treatment, for the way God is unjustly treating him, and then being vindicated through that encounter. This is Job fantasizing. He calls God to account, and then through that encounter, he's vindicated. And he says in verses 8 and 9 that he can't find God to press his case with him. But he says in 10a that God knows where he is. God knows where he is, and Job is confident that if God will test him, he will pass the test with flying colors. That's in verse 10b there. He says at the end, I shall come out as gold. That's Job's understanding. Job is, if I can get this audience with him, I can put my case to him. I'm coming out as gold, And he says his confidence in the outcome of that encounter that he's fantasizing about, his confidence is because, as he says in verses 11 and 12 of chapter 23, is that he's righteous. You see, he has held to God's way 
He has held to God's word. So when he puts his case there, he's coming out like gold. He says in verses 13 to 16, he shifts here from how he would like his encounter with God to be, this fantasizing about this encounter with God, with God where he is vindicated in that forum. Well, he shifts from that to the reality of his emotions. And he recognizes that God is unlike any other being. You see, which introduces a kind of wild card factor into encountering God. God is the other. So he's unlike any other being, which, you know, it creates this uncertainty. And the fact he's all powerful. That combines with his inscrutability to terrify Job. You see, he's got this wild card thing. He's unlike any other being. And on top of that, he's all powerful. So when you encounter him, Job is terrified about it. Nevertheless, he says in 23, 17, that he will not let his terror and his dread, he won't let that keep him from setting his case before God Almighty. That he will do that if he's given the opportunity. Then in 24, 1, he asks why God is not acting in a timely manner against the wicked, contrary to the expectation of his three friends there and their sense of retributive justice where they're saying no a person can only flourish for a little bit and then he's taken out he says well why isn't he acting in a timely manner now against the wicked and he then in in 24 verse 2 all the way down through the next slide verse 17 in verses 2 through 17 he gives a list of crimes of the wicked the kinds of things that the wicked are doing and couldn't we do that you know, you could, you could just ro- roll them off. He gives that list, and that list includes, in verses 5 through 8, and in verses 10 through 12, it includes a portrait of the pitiable condition of the orphan, the widow, the poor, and the needy upon whom the wicked prey. And you just read this description of their situation and circumstance. And the wicked carry on, he says in verse 12, with seeming impunity, while the pleas of the suffering go unheeded. You see, he says in verse 12, from out of the city the dying groan and the soul of the wounded cries, yet God charges no one with wrong. You see, this is Job's thing. He's saying, what are you telling me? You're telling me, oh, no, 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 the God will be right wicked, maybe for a second, taken out. He says, look at this. You see, and very much it sounds like Kohelet in Ecclesiastes. As he looks around the world and he sees moral disorder more often than he would like or would expect. And he's asking what's going on with that. And in 24, in verses in 18 to 20, he says his friends, his friends claim that the wicked have a short and cursed life on earth. That's their view. That's what they've been telling him. And then he counters that in verses 21 to 24, claiming that God prolongs the lives of the wicked and that he gives them security until they die in keeping with the lot of all mankind. There's nothing exceptional about their death. It's not like he prolongs it and they die this agonizing death at the end. He says, no, he prolongs their life, keeps them alive, the wicked, and then they pass just like everybody else. There's no distinction that is made there. They, they go the, the, the lot of all mankind without experiencing any kind of exceptional end. And then in verse 25, he challenges them to deny what he's just said. If it's not so, who will prove me a liar and show that there's nothing in what I say? If I'm, if, you know, if I'm not telling the truth, then, then you call me out and you demonstrate that. Then in chapter 25, we get Bildad, and this is the shortest of all the speeches. And here, Bildad in 25, and the point of his short speech is that God is so magnificent that no human can be righteous or pure before him. Indeed, he says humans are maggots or worms in God's sight. 
And his point is that given that, it's just absurd for Job to claim that he could vindicate himself by establishing his righteousness if only he could get an audience with God. He's saying, like, what, are you crazy? Now, of course, mankind in its fallen state is twisted, bent, and alienated from God. And in that state and in that sense... Mankind can justify the deprecating and even revolting image of maggots and worms because we are twisted and alienated. And you see that in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 14. But it's important to recognize that the image of God in mankind is not extinguished. Humans were the pinnacle of creation. And we're the physical creatures with whom God will share his love forever. For all our warts, for all our brokenness, and all of our bentness, because of the invasion of sin into this creation, we remain precious in God's sight. The primary object of God's redemptive work. So yes, are we maggots and worms? There is a sense that's fair, but that has to be balanced with the truth that we continue to possess God's image and that God continues to see us as very precious. Now, contrary to Bildad, what he's claiming, the question about Job's suffering, it's not whether any human is sinless, whether any human is absolutely righteous or pure, so he could stand before God as a worthy being? That's not the question. Rather, the question is why Job, who is in fact relatively righteous, so righteous in fact that God picked him out of all of humanity to be mankind's champion, to be an example of what it means to be a truly pious, devout person. So if anybody has a claim to relative righteousness, it's Job. So he's that person. You see, so the question is, why Job? This righteous person, why he's suffering so greatly, why he's suffering like the greatest of sinners. That's the question. It's not, can he bring a perfect, pure, spotless life and stand before God on his own? The question is why, though he excels in righteousness, he's treated like the worst of sinners. Job, who knows that he's righteous. As I say, Job lives in here. Job, who knows that he's righteous, he insists that God is unjust. That's how he sees the situation. I know I'm righteous, and yet I'm being beaten to death like the worst of sinners. God is unjust for doing so. His three friends, they reason from the fact that he's suffering so intensely. Their conclusion is, you're a closet sinner and an exceptional one at that. You see, you are despicable because you you have a pretense, a facade of righteousness when you are really, really bad. Now, Job speaks, he says in 26, 1 to 4, he blasts his friends with these rhetorical questions indicating that their advice to him has been worthless. Their words certainly have not come from God. So he blasts them. And then he says in 26, 5 to 13, he speaks of God's fear-inspiring awesomeness and his great power that is manifested in God's works. You see, he can affirm all those truths As well as his friends can. God's greatness and God's power, they're not an issue. That's not the question. Now some of the verses here I thought warranted a special comment. Because there there are a lot of things that are puzzling in here. But sometimes exceptionally so. So I want to take a second and just point out some things or or say a bit about them. He says in verse 5 that the dead tremble. And I think it should probably better be translated after that, as do the waters 
and their inhabitants. So you have both the dead and you have this mysterious deep that is looked at as this black box that we don't really know what goes on. It's threatening and all this. But not only are the dead, but the inhabitants of the sea, that they all wind up trembling. And the point is that there's no hiding from God. You see, even in the realm of the dead, there's no hiding from God. And he refers in verse 10 to God's establishment of the horizon, see, which encircles the earthly observer, and he describes it as a boundary of light and darkness. You see, from an earthly perspective, right? Well, first, if you're out somewhere and it's wide open, like if you're out in the middle of the ocean, what would you see? You would just see horizon all around, right? And so he describes it that way as this circle around, and from an earthly perspective, daylight rises from where it rises from beneath the eastern horizon and it chases darkness away chases it to below the western horizon and then as as the light then descends in the the western horizon it surrenders to the spread of darkness so that's what he's talking about he's just talking about horizons and part of god's creation the reference in verses 12 and 13 to the defeat of Rahab and the defeat of the fleeing serpent. That is, again, that's another reference to pagan creation mythology about Rahab and about this fleeing servant. As I said, in reference to chapter 9, verse 13, even if, okay, it's, we don't know what Job is thinking here, but even if Job believed the pagan myth was true, rather than simply using a culturally known story to make a point. Job may not believe it's true. Job may simply be using a common story that is known in the culture to make a point. Okay, But even if Job believed the pagan myth was true, God does not say the pagan myth is true. You see, that's an important thing to recognize. Job and his friends, as I've said before, and especially Job's friends, they're presented in the book as wisdom teachers who have a lot to learn. You see, their discussion is essentially a foil for the normative teaching of the book. And that normative teaching only comes when God registers his perspective, and then you come and stand and you look at the book through that. Now you're able to put what is the message of God in the book of Job? As I say, you can't simply parachute into books and pull out lines. It's very similar to the way Ecclesiastes functions. You see, so that's so even if even if Job, we don't know of Job. Job could have been just using a cultural story to make a point. But even if Job did believe that story, God doesn't say that story is true. All right, in 2614, he says the greatness and power of God that he's just laid out. That that's a mere sketch. That, that, that's something that just touched the hem of the garment. God's power is beyond comprehension. Job knows that. Job doesn't contest that. So that's not the issue. You see, that's not something that, that is really, a, this, that's not what the debate is about. And in 27, 1 to 6, he swears by the living God who he adds, by the way, has denied him justice and made him bitter. But he swears by the living God that as long as he lives, he will not deny the truth that he is righteous. You see, he's not going to do that. Despite how his friends may badger him, he will not abandon his integrity in that matter and embrace a lie. He knows He's righteous. He knows he's genuine. He knows he's not a phony. He knows he's lived his life in submission to God and he will not say otherwise. And that's the pledge that he makes there. That's what he swears. And then in verses 7 to 10, he expresses his desire for God to treat his enemies. You see, he wants God to treat his enemies as the wicked and unrighteous, instead of unfairly treating him that way. I'm pious. <laughs> you know, 
I'm righteous. I've lived my life, a consecrated life. What I want you to do is to turn your guns in the right direction. I'm the good guy. So I want you to turn here on the enemy. See, when God, he, and Job knows that when God treats somebody as wicked and righteous, as, as, as wicked and un, unrighteous, as God, as he thinks God has wrongly done to him, it's a hopeless crushing. See, when God turns that gaze on you, he knows from personal experience that it's a hopeless crushing. So he's saying, point that in the right direction. Point it in the right direction. Then in 27, 11, Job tells them that he'll teach them how God really works in the world. He says he'll teach them how God really works in the world. He won't conceal it from them. But before getting to that, he says, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll tell you how he works. But before getting to that, he chastises them. In verses 12 to 23, he takes what his friends insist that they have seen. You see in chapter, in, in verse 12a, and what they insist they have, they have seen is in verse 13, God invariably punishes the wicked, which punishment Job then details in verses 14 to 23, echoing their claims, the claims of his friends about the fate of the wicked. And Job asks why, in light of their alleged observation, we've seen God invariably punishing the wicked, such as you see in these cases. But then Job asks, in light of their, their alleged observation, you know, how they've, they've become altogether vain. If that's the case, if you have in fact observed God invariably punishing the wicked, then why have you become like the wicked in speaking nonsense about my situation? If you've truly seen that God invariably punishes the wicked, wouldn't a wise man then stay away from wickedness? And yet, what are you doing? You're lying about me. <laughs> I, I thought you were a wise man. Yet from your own mouth, this is what you're saying. And the wise thing to do then would be you wouldn't be lying on me. You see, if you were truly wise in your conviction that God invariably punishes the wicked in the ways you claim that God punishes the wicked, which are horrible, well, that should have kept you from your vain, that is your false and therefore unrighteous accusations against me. So Job says that now. We get to chapter 28, many scholars, okay, many scholars insist that chapter 28 contradicts the sentiments expressed by Job elsewhere, and therefore they relocate the chapter. They relocate the chapter, they claim that it was a disjointed insertion by a later editor who stuck it in there to soften Job's bold words, or they assign it to the narrator. In other words, Job is speaking, and then when you get to 28, even though there's no indication of a change, we have the narrator speaking here to kind of soften what Job is saying. So you have many people that look at it that way, so the fact so many people look at it that way is that it's a serious uh, concern. But I don't agree with that. So you have been informed that there are many that disagree with me on this, but I don't think that's the way to go. There's no textual support for those moves. No indication that somebody else is speaking. No indication that this is a dislocated chapter, but I think it's unnecessary. And the reason I think it's unnecessary, I don't believe that Job is here acknowledging and bowing before the Lord's vastly superior knowledge and wisdom and thus already accepting the perspective of the book's end. I don't think that's what's going on. Rather, I think what he's doing is he confesses God as the source of all true wisdom. He makes that confession to raise and to reset the issue that bedevils him. Namely, that God has defined wisdom for mankind... <laughs> 
But he's reneged on that definition in Job's case. That's the thing. God is the one who has, knows wisdom, and he's defined wisdom. But he's reneged on that definition in my case. I think he's simply raising and resetting the issue. That's why Job immediately launches back into the complaints about his life in chapters 29 through 31. This is a reset. And it is a reset that is done based on the fact that God is the one with wisdom. He defines wisdom. And then Job says that's true. He defines wisdom. But he's reneged on that definition. Because I lived according to that. And you see what happened to me. You'll see this, I hope. In 28, 1 to 11. He says mankind has an unprecedented ability among God's creatures to ferret out precious metals and stones from the earth. Humans are ingenious and energetic in that regard. Whereas the animal kingdom, they're oblivious to it. I mean, they walk by diamonds, what do they care? Gold, silver. But he says, see, human beings, we have this energy and this ingenuity when it comes to that. Yet he says in verses 12 to 19, he says, we have no comparable appreciation for or skill in obtaining wisdom, which is far more valuable. Indeed, wisdom, he says in 20 to 22, wisdom, it's seemingly inaccessible. You see, it just seems so difficult to get at. But of course, God knows all about it. Right? He says in verses 23 and 24, God, because he's omniscient. God knows all about it, so one can do no better than to rely on what the omniscient God says about wisdom. Okay, now the problem that Job is having is with what God revealed to man early on about the essence of wisdom and understanding. What did God say in verse 28? He said, the fear of the Lord is wisdom. And turning away from evil is understanding. The implication being that one who lived a life of faithfulness and submission, who lived with wisdom and understanding as defined by God, would stay on the path of God's blessing and protection. That was the understood fruit of the wise living that God prescri prescribed, that's why it was wise. Why is this wise? You're telling me this is the way to live. Well, isn't it because if I live that way, I will stay in your good graces and I will be blessed? That's what you said. That's what you talked about. You see, and it's the failure of that to be true in Job's case. That fuels his sense of injustice. He, again, he's a paragon of righteousness. An absolute paragon of righteousness, and yet he's suffering like the greatest of fools. He's suffering like the, those who have no fear of God and who wallow in evil. And that, according to Job, is the fact of how God works in the world. Remember, he told him, I'm going to tell you how God works in the world. I won't hold it back from you. And then he comes and he, he rebukes them. But now this is, this is how he works. He has said, here's how to live. You live that way, and what do you get? You get crushed. You get crushed. So that's what Job, I think, see in this chapter, that's what I, I think he's simply resetting the issue, but doing it in terms of the fact that God in his omniscience is the one who knows true wisdom, and yet God reneges on what he's revealed about true wisdom. Because I lived according to that, and look what has happened to me. So I think that's what's going on there. Uh, now Job, he makes the, this point, this point I'm talking about, he makes this point as he resumes speaking in chapter 29. He lived in fear of the Lord, and he turned from evil. But now what's, what's he left with? Now he's left to long for the days before his suffering. He's left to long for the days when he received the expected fruit of wise and understanding living. 
He indicates in verses 1 to 11 that, it, that in bygone days, he was blessed by God. And he was respected and honored among men because, he says in verses 12 to 17, he lived righteously. You see, that everything was going according to Hoyle. I lived righteously. I lived according to God's defined wisdom. I feared the Lord. I turned from evil. I lived that way and everything was fine. I was getting all the good stuff. I lived righteously. He was helping all the needy. He was opposing the unrighteous, which is a nice little footnote, by the way. Being righteous sometimes requires opposing wickedness. But he says, see, at that time, he says in verses 18 to 20, he thought he would live a, a life full of good things. That was how he thought at the time when the good times were rolling and he was getting what he perceived to be the fruit of living according to God's wisdom. And in 29, 21 to 25, he speaks again of the blessedness of his former days, how great they were. And then in chapter 30, verses 1 to 15, chapter 30, he, he laments his present state. He says in 31 to 15 that, that even children of his social inferior, their children, children of his social inferiors, they laugh at him. And those that have been banished to living in the wilderness, people who have been ostracized completely by the society, driven out in the way away from the coast, even those people, they mock him in songs. They avoid him and they spit at the sight of him. So the lowest in the society, those who've been ostracized, they even make fun of him. And you see what Job is going through. Because of what God has done to him, he's despised. And he's therefore lost all of the social protection that his status afforded him. You see, people who have social position, they are insulated from certain attacks. But once that is dropped, it's open season. And you can see that in that Hollywood dude. You see, once the, once the status is dropped, everybody and his mother's on you. Well, this is what Job is saying. Whatever protection he had from that. So it's open season on him. He's just being attacked from everywhere. And then in 30, 16 to 19, he says his life is being drained from him by his persistent pain and suffering. God has powerfully seized him, like by the lapels. God has powerfully seized him and thrown him in the mud. He subjected him to abject humiliation. And as I say, I don't know how... how in our society, if we, I think personally we do. Nobody likes to be humiliated and shamed, you see. But in this culture, this would have been magnified. And that's what Job is experiencing. And he says in verse 20 to 23, he complains that God doesn't respond to him. And he says, God has become cruel toward him, tossing him about in a storm and taking him to his death. So, you know, you know how all what Job has been going through through this prolonged pain and all that he's endured. And you see the kinds of things in his perspective. And he says in verse 24 to 26 that those suffering through a disaster, those suffering through a disaster, they cry out for help. You see, they, they cry out for help. And that he wept. See, they cry out, and what does he do? He wept for the hurting. And he grieved for the needy. See, so you have people who are suffering, they cry out. What is Job's response? He wept. He, he, he grieved for them. But when he cried out in his suffering, hoping for good and waiting for light, only bad things and darkness came. Now, the not so subtle implication is that God has failed to have the same compassion that Job had. When the suffering cried out, Job's heart bled and he grieved for them. When Job cried out, he got nothing. 
he got no relief. And so that's, what, that's the implication there. He says in, in verses 27 to 31, he speaks of his turmoil, his physical suffering, his disfiguration, his abandonment, and his mourning. He's just getting the hammer. You know, you, you could hardly be uh, driven to greater suffering without dying. So Job's about maxed out in suffering. And what is happening to him. And it always pays to keep that in mind as we gauge the things that Job says. In chapter 31, this great chapter. In chapter 31, Job, he lays out his righteousness in protest of the treatment that he's received. This reminds me like Paul when Paul says, I'm out of my mind to talk like this. But Job here is going to lay out and put forth his case for his righteousness. And he says in verses 1 to 4 that he kept himself from lusting after young women. He, he didn't do that. Ooh. That's pretty good, isn't it, guys? That's, that's pretty serious. That's pretty serious devotion. He kept himself from that. He kept himself from lusting after young women in the belief that God punishes the unrighteous. And he says in verses 5 to 8, that if he were a wicked person, if he were a liar, a deceiver, one who followed his own desires rather than God's, or one who had unclean hands, if any of that was true in his case, he would accept the punishment he deserved. And he indicates in verse 6 what he wants are honest scales. He wants a fair judgment in the matter. That's what he's after. And he continues in that same vein in verses 9 to 12. He says in 9 to 12 that if he pursued his neighbor's wife, if he were an adulterer, then he deserves for others to have his wife. If that's the kind of man he was, if that was the kind of person he was, that would be a terrible crime. That would be something that would be punishable by the judges and something that would rightly destroy whatever he had achieved in this life. He's saying, if I had done that, I'd have no beef with any of this. It would be perfectly fine. It would be as it should be. But I didn't do any of that. He says in 13 to 15, that if he, hadn't, if he had not treated the complaints of his servants fairly, if he hadn't done that, he would have no defense when God, who is the protector of the socially vulnerable. Think about that. God is the protector of the socially vulnerable because it is relevant to this whole question of abortion. But he says there, he says, look, that, it, that if God... If he had not treated the complaints of his servants fairly, then he wouldn't have any defense when God came against him. What could he say? Because he'd be guilty because God is the protector of the socially vulnerable. And if he had abused those who were under him, he had used his power over them to abuse them, he wouldn't have anything to say. See, before God, all people are equal. He says, you see, that he made them all. All people are equal as he made them all, so a superior social position provides no justification for abusing or exploiting others, and Job hadn't done that. Job said, if I'd have done that, that'd have been a different story. But I hadn't done that. He says in 16 to 23 that he would deserve punishment if he had neglected or mistreated the poor or needy the widow or the orphan, but he didn't, for he feared the wrath of God. He says in, in 14, 31, 24 to 28, that he never defrauded God by giving his trust and allegiance to wealth. He never made an idol out of his wealth. He didn't do that or giving his trust and allegiance to some astral deity like the sun or the moon. He made no false gods. That's a good life. That's a good life. 
He made no false gods. Then he says in 29 to 40 of chapter 31 that he would deserve punishment if he rejoiced when disaster struck those who hated him. That's pretty, that's pretty up there, isn't it? He said, I deserve punishment if I had rejoiced when those who hated me, disaster struck them. I didn't do that. I would deserve punishment if I had cursed those who hated me. He didn't do that. If he would deserve punishment if he had not been generous and hospitable. If he had hidden his sin. Or if he'd taken crops from his land without paying those who were owed for those crops. Those who had worked the land. He didn't do any of that. He didn't do it. But he hadn't done that. And then he interjects in verses 35 to 37 his longing for an audience with God. He wants a hearing. Because he's being wronged in his judgment. And at the end, in verse 40, it says the words of Job are ended. Meaning that this is the end of his interaction with Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. Now, God is going to respond to Job's words. But first, a previously unmentioned bystander. This fellow named Elihu. He jumps into the dispute. But do notice that you don't get here so far in the third cycle. I mentioned that before. And I think that's part of this uh, signaling the futility of what's going on. And then very dramatically when you think that's the end of Job's words, this whole thing, it got so to the point that it didn't, there was nothing left for so far to say. So he doesn't even complete the cycle. So you're saying, okay, that sends a message about how they're groping, groping, and never coming to anything about wisdom that is not revealed by God. But then it's like one of these television shows where you think it's over and then here comes something else, like something pops up, you know, something comes out of the bedroom or something. Well, now what do we have? This unmentioned person, Elihu, comes in and he jumps into the fray. And you see Elihu talks in 32 to 37. And Elihu says in verses 1 to 5, now interesting too, here we get we get prose, we get narrative. Remember, we had narrative in the prologue, and we go to we go to poetry in chapter 3. We come all the way through here, and now we have this short prose, this narrative introduction of Elihu in verses 1 to 5. And I hear that second bell. So we will leave Lord Willing, Elihu, to next week. Thanks for coming.